Thank you, John. My name is Kurt Barth, and I'm Associate Director of the Next Generation Photovoltaic Center at the CSU site. And though I don't normally put this affiliation, I'm also a member of the International Task Group 8 on Thin Film Module Reliability. And I put that there to highlight that I've been working on module reliability and encapsulation for 13 years now. I just checked my lab notebooks going back and was a bit surprised myself that I've been involved in module reliability and encapsulation this long. The title of my talk is Thin Film Module Encapsulation Opportunities to Improve Costs, Reliability, and Manufacturing Efficiencies. The goal of our center is to make solar electricity a major source of energy. And we focused primarily over the last period of years on improving module efficiency, conversion efficiencies. And that's a great opportunity to lower the costs and improve the usage of solar. But one of the objectives of my talk today is to demonstrate that there's other fertile opportunities associated with the module package and encapsulation. I'm going to talk about three main areas. First of all, talk about what is module encapsulation, how does it relate to the device and to the overall deployment of solar. Second of all, talk about reliability and manufacturing issues, and I'll identify some opportunities there. And then lastly, I'll discuss ways that we're doing research to advance new architectures and to address some of those issues that we identified. So in a PV system, you see that there's arrays, inverters, power conditioning equipment, racking. And I talk today I'm going to focus primarily just on the module. There's a whole series of other activities, other aspects that are important to reliability, but we're going to just focus on the solar module package today. And if you look at a generalized package, you see that it has a number of attributes, particularly for thin film. It's often glass glass. That is, there's a glass substrate, a thin film, and a glass back. The module provides the environmental protection. It gives mechanical protection to the semiconductors and the bus bars. And it provides electrical safety and isolation. And the field module arrays can run up to 1,500 volts So in Europe. So we have to provide electrical safety and isolation. And the module also provides an opportunity to mount the module in the field. Now, the architecture, that is the structure of this package as we design it, is important for the reliability and for achieving the mandatory certifications, both UL and IEC. Now, thin film devices, in contrast to crystal and silicon, as I mentioned, are primarily glass-glass packages. This is the most common structure used. And that's the film is deposited on a glass or um, uh, perhaps a metal foil, and then sealed between two glass plates. There's usually a lamination film shown by the light blue encapsulant there, and sophisticated thin film modules will use an edge seal. The edge seal is typically a butyl rubber material, and that's a low permeability material that aids in reducing the moisture ingress. And I'll talk more about that and how important the moisture performance is for modules. So edge seals are used in most thin film modules. They're key to achieving good performance. Now, module reliability directly impacts the levelized cost of energy, and that is the cost that it take the cost of electricity from solar, taking all the costs and aspects into account. This is a generalized curve. Uh, presented by Beck, uh, Marcus Beck a couple of years ago that just shows a generic calculation for modules with a degradation rate. Less degradation, better LCOE, showing significant opportunity. Now this is a chart taken from a really interesting paper recently published by the management of the DOE Sunshot program. And this shows different cost curves and different lifetime curves for a generic module. All curves here are six cents per kilowatt hour. That is, they're all the same LCOE. So if you have a module that's a good performing module, better than or at least as good as industry standard currently, 
has a 30-year life and low degradation of 0.2% per year. If you can improve that to a 50-year life with the same degradation, the value is double. That's significant. What that says is a module manufacturer can charge twice as much for the same module while giving their customers the same value, the same LCOE, if they can improve the lifetime and potentially reduce the degradation rate of their module. So there's a significant opportunity here. Alternate path is that we could say we could reduce the LCOE, charge the same amount for the module. Very significant opportunity to advance solar by improving reliability. Now, moving forward, again, more data from NREL showing that different opportunities to achieve three cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, DOE believes that that is a level where solar will be competitive in all environments with traditional energy. That's a, that's a very uh, significant number and will allow widespread penetration of solar. Uh, clearly would, would compete or beat all traditional energy resources currently at that price. And this is a breakdown chart of what it would take to achieve that. And you can see two keys here are increase in module efficiency from 16% to 25%, and also improving the reliability. So this has an opportunity to change three what, pardon me, 1.3 cents per kilowatt hour just to improve the module reliability. And it's nearly as impactful as changing the module efficiency from 16 to 25 percent. And for those of us who've worked on device performance, that's a steep level to achieve. So improving the module reliability has nearly the same impact as working to improve the device performance. But it's an area that I don't think is being recognized as having that level of impact and having that level of resources devoted to it. So, now thin film modular reliability is not able yet to achieve that 50% lifetime or that 2% degradation that we'd really like to see. Typical module warranties are for 25 years with a degradation rate of 97% of the rated power over the first year and 0.7% degradation through 25 years. Now that's the warranty. Uh, modules uh, from sophisticated manufacturers will typically do better than that, but that's the warranted level. Now, NREL studies have shown that fielded modules from a variety of different manufacturers, um, some of which are with us now and some of which are not, uh, have shown degradation rates in the 0.5% a year up to 1.8% a year, fairly significant, with SIGs anamorphous silicon and polycrystal silicon being even higher. So we're nowhere near that level that's needed to really make a significant impact on the LCOE. So improvements are needed to achieve those goals to impact opportunities with solar. Now, when we talk about module reliability, there's mechanical aspects. The module has to withstand hail, wind loading, of course, there's the transportation, installation in the field. All those are important. But for long-term degradation, long-term reliability, moisture ingress dominates. The moisture ingress performance of particularly thin film module determines its long-term reliability and basically determines with a sophisticated semiconductor processing, the module package determines and moisture ingress determines that degradation rate. Now, there's been a number of studies that bear this out, again, primarily uh, driven by NREL. The, um, the key point is that thin films are very sensitive to moisture, much more so than typical crystal and silicon modules. Uh, crystal and silicon wafers have significant processing and a reflective coatings, um, aluminum oxide coatings now that are quite durable we don't see that level of durability in unencapsulated thin film, so they're more sensitive to moisture. We've done a number of tests that show we apply water, vapor, and heat. We see degradation in a module, dry inert with heat, minimal degradation. And then there's been a number of reviews by Jordan and 
uh, Sarah Kurtz and other NREL folks that have shown that modules in hot, humid climates are seeing more degradation than those in hot, dry climates or cool climates. Again, all suggesting or all indicating very strongly that moisture ingress is a key. So the controlling and ultimately minimizing the exposure of the thin films to humidity is a requirement to achieve these long-term module lives. Now, that's a long-term degradation rate. There's also aspects that we've seen where modules have failed more short-term short accelerated tests. And a real great example of this is the failure rate in qualification testing. All modules need to go through, they're sold in Europe or the US, I need to go through certification testing to achieve the IEC and UI a stamp of approval. And those tests are fairly rigorous. And two of ETL down in Arizona has kept track of the failure rate of modules that are submitted for this qualification testing. And you can see by the chart that over the years, the vast majority of failures for modules have come from the tests that involve humidity. Now, these tests are performed as a capstone to the module development. These are expensive, long-duration tests. They take many months. They're done by an independent lab. And they're done on modules that are presumably ready for market as the final certification. They're too expensive and too time-consuming to use as a product development activity. So presumably, the people that submitted these modules that show these high failure rates expected them to pass. So you see how impactful the moisture degradation rate is for new module development. Lawn duration stress is another key aspect where we've seen that moisture performance is an issue. Uh, Fraunhofer in Germany, an independent lab, uh, obtained commercial thin film modules a number of years ago and subjected them to the damp heat test. This is an 85 degrees C, 85% relative humidity test. Certification standards require that to go for 1,000 hours. Fraunhofer took these modules out to 4,000 hours. And you can see that there are significant issues with many of these modules. The performance up to 1,000 hours wasn't too bad, but you can see that after 1,000 hours, the modules dropped precipitously. And again, these were commercially available modules a number of years ago. Now, studies by uh, our colleague Michael Kempe at NREL says that about 5,000 hours of this type of test is needed for 25 years to emulate 25 years in hot, humid climates such as Miami. So this is not an unreasonable duration test and suggests that there's issues with modules. You can see here to the right that we've actually delaminated some of the films from the modules under this test. So moisture ingress and its associated, active, uh, associated degradation rate of UV degradation are keys to driving long-term reliability. Now, I mentioned that thin film modules primarily use edge seals. Sophisticated modules will use edge seals to help reduce the permeation of moisture into the module and contacting the semi-humidity. So they laminate the, they put these edge seals around the perimeter and then go through a lamination cycle with vacuum. Um, without the edge seals, there's been a number of studies and, and manufacturers found that just the normal lamination films are insufficient to pass the test, let alone go for these long duration accelerated tests. But these edge seals with lamination are no silver bullet. Um, degradation has been seen even with good quality edge seals in 300 to 1,500 hours. So just applying an edge seal isn't a solution to the whole problem. Now, I do want to call out that thin film industry leaders, uh, first solar included, has demonstrated some significantly better performance than I'm showing here. But they also use edge seals. And their performance is not strong enough that they've been able to warrant their product for anything more than the industry standard. 25 years, so there's still an opportunity there. Now, I mentioned UV degradation, and this is a key aspect that has been demonstrated to cause failure in edge seals. And avoiding UV degradation is really critical. 
we've got these edge seals, even if they're performing well. And that bond between the glass and the edge shield degrades under UV light, then that's defeated the purpose of this low moisture vapor permeable material. If that bond degrades, water can go in along that bond line, and it doesn't matter how permeable the edge seal material is or how resistant to permeation it is, if water can go in along that bond. Now, UV attacks carbon-carbon bonds in polymers that are used for the edge seals. It's just uh, attacks that directly and can cleave that. So they'll put carbon additives in these materials to help minimize that. And from a bulk perspective, that can actually be effective. The carbon black added to the polymer can help with the UV degradation. But if you think about what an edge seal does, again, along that bond line interfacing the glass, the UV light can contact and degrade that bond line. It doesn't really matter, again, what it does to the bulk. It can be degradating. It can be severely, uh, cause severe degradation. Now, so what do people do? Well, in applications where it's critical for polymers to live a long time, where they see UV light, they use silicones. And the case here is they'll bond spandrel glass and uh, some of these large glass windows in high-rise office buildings with silicones. They do not use any of these polymers with the carbon-carbon chain bonds. So silicones are used in this application. You can imagine on the building to the right there, if one of those glass plates were to come be debonded and fall, it could be, uh, it could be deadly. And you don't want to have people going up there and regluing those things periodically as a maintenance procedure. So silicone is a key to long, to avoiding long duration UV degradation. Now moving on to discussing manufacturing. Most modules today, in fact all those from major manufacturers, are produced by lamination. And that's where they have a vacuum laminator, these films are laid up, the package is assembled with all these different films and edge seals. And then it's put into a laminator, which simultaneously applies heat and vacuum, de-airs any, any of the films, and presses all the constituent plates and films together. That process can take between 12 and 20 minutes, with about 13 and a half being industry standard for high-quality materials, uh, including EVA and some of the more uh, the newer ionomer materials. Um, these lamination films are thin. They're about 18 uh, mils thick. 18,000 seven inch thick. And if you're putting that on a two foot by four foot module, they're, they're elastomeric, so they're tacky. They're difficult to move around in manufacturing because the aspect ratio and because they're difficult to handle and they're fragile. And because of this large cycle time, you need to do multiple modules at the same time to keep up with the other manufacturing processes. And you can see the size of a laminator here relative to a person. And this would be sufficient for something on the order of 50 to 100 megawatts a year production. So maybe 200 watts a year production, depending on the cycle time. Um, sophisticated thin film manufacturers are, are three gigawatt a year production. So you can imagine the square footage of laminators that are needed. Again, this is a batch and queue operation because other processes in the manufacturing including the semiconductor deposition on the order 30-second cycle time. This can all be rolled up in the analysis of costs. And this is the breakdown of the cost analysis from NREL for Cattel manufacturing. And you see that the back end, which includes the encapsulation materials and capital equipment, is represented by the depreciation of the dark purple there is the most expensive of the four cost centers in the Cattail manufacturing. The encapsulation and the back end processing is more expensive than the semiconductor deposition. That, I think that's amazing. But we consider the most value added aspect. The thing that actually converts the sunlight to the electricity is less expensive than the encapsulation and it's more routine back end. So, this is a significant opportunity for improvement in a manufacturing perspective. 
So we've got opportunities from reliability. We have opportunities from a manufacturing perspective. And if we look at this, what would be a wish list for module manufacturing? If we were to sit with a clean sheet of paper and say, okay, what would we really like? Well, from a performance perspective, we want extreme robustness to moisture. We've seen that that's a key issue. We want excellent adhesion under prolonged UV exposure to maintain that edge seal. From a manufacturing perspective, we want the cycle time under a minute to keep up with our semiconductor processes and avoid any batching and queuing. And we want to have a small manufacturing tool footprint. And of course, cost drives this industry, so we want a reduction in materials costs and ideally in capital equipment costs. So at CSU here with our partners, we've worked to develop a module architecture that can achieve hopefully those exact qualifications and, and requirements. So we've started back, again I mentioned back now uh, 13 years, and we've developed this to a point where we're getting close to demonstrating all these key attributes. So the design focus was to reduce the moisture availability to semi-films. I underline the availability because in the past we've talked about moisture ingress. That's really not the key. The key is where is the moisture going and what does it degrade once it's in there. And I'll talk about that more in a second, but remember that availability aspect. Of course, we want robustness to UV and we want to facilitate manufacturing. And we started this as, again as a clean sheet design at CSU. And we advanced it when I was at a bound solar. We ended up producing a million modules with what I'm now calling a prototype version of this architecture. We've, we've gone significantly beyond what we had at a bound, but we learned quite a bit there. And we've had an additional sunshot support about 18 months ago for further cost reduction. Okay, our partners over this development as a USDOE and sunshot, uh, we've worked with NREL closely, including some of the researchers I mentioned, Kempe and uh, Sarah Kurtz and such, um, the small company Direct Solar here in Fort Collins, and uh, Semitech PVMC. Our current status is that we're optimizing the key material selection for cost and ease of dispensing. We have a good architecture developed, but we're working with polymer vendors to get that last step, specify those last materials. And we're developing a more sophisticated and more advanced CSU NREL partnership. Prototypes of this architecture have already passed the IEC and UL certification standards. So looking at the architecture that we've been working on, it doesn't use lamination. We use a low permeability, moisture permeability edge seal, but it's a two-part edge seal where we have on the very edge silicone. And recall that's the material, the commonly available, available elastomeric material that can handle UV. We glue the module plates together using the silicon. That's robust to UV and it's great from liquid water perspective. Now inboard we do use a low moisture vapor transmissive polyisobutylene. Now even if there's a breach in the PIV over the design life of the module, say we get a very small breach in regions adjacent to the glass, the silicon will still protect us from any liquid water ingress. We have a relatively small edge seal that's able to handle the entire mechanical load and still perform adequately. Then inboard, we use a low-cost polymer that's desiccated. And this is a key. We are going to see diffusion over a 50-year lifetime no matter what materials we use, the polymer materials we use on the edge. So having desiccation in board does two things for us. It allows us to specify the partial pressure of water vapor that we want to see adjacent to the semiconductor films. And it also gives us a safety factor if something does breach, if there is a pinhole, or if there is a, is a failure due to UV, or if there is an aspect from a manufacturing excursion we can load the desk in such as the module is still protected. Now to facilitate the removal of the water that does permeate through the edge, 
we have these small channels adjacent to the semiconductor film. So the combination of the desiccation and low permeability edge seal here to silicon gives us a robust module architecture. Now how do we fabricate these materials into a module? Well, the materials are sourced in a 55-gallon drum. And you can use what's called a hot melt press, which is industry standard for dispensing sealants. And you can apply that with an XY table. We're dispensing these materials around the perimeter, and then in the middle of the module, we can have XY tables, commonly available commercial things. And we can integrate that into a automated system that can be linked sequentially in line with other processes, including the semiconductor processes. Now, the cycle time of each of these steps can be under 30 seconds each. And we did demonstrate that at a bound. We were able to do these processes adequately on the order of 20 second cycle time and saw extreme robust module performance. So if we're to link these together, you can see what a manufacturing process flow would look like. So in a factory, we would have a bus semiconductor circuit plate arrive on the left side of this graphic. Then we put the edge seal, the rubber PIB, outboard of that, in board of that, pardon me, we'd put the desk, desk and internal polymer. And in that application, we'd have more than one head. We would be dispensing through multiple heads so we could keep the cycle time down, back time. Then we'd position the back glass and press that gently. And lastly, we would put the cord plate and pot the cord plate and then do the silicon edge seal. Now we could do the silicon edge seal adjacent to the PIB application as well. But you get an understanding that all these processes can be done quickly in an automated way. Additionally, we could use the same sealing, that is the silicone PIB technology, for sealing the cord plate. That's also been an issue in an area of moisture ingress into the modules. And we can use the same technologies and even the same tools to apply the cord plate. So what does this manufacturing process flow give us? Well, three to five times faster production speed that's in line with other processes compared to lamination. If you can see, these are relatively simple tools. And if using fully automated versions of these, the, we're seeing something on order of 5x reduction in capital equipment costs at a, at a high level. We probably would see more if you take the batching and queuing and the lamination layup stages. But just with these applications here, we can see a 5x reduction in capex and a 5x reduction in the factory footprint for the tooling, which itself carries a significant cost. So great. We have a manufacturing benefit. We, in theory, have a structure that's resistant to UV and has high capability for moisture ingress. But how does it perform? Well, we've tested prototype modules, and they've been able to go 4,000 to 5,000 hours of that damp heat. And you can recall, this was the test that Fraunhofer did on commercially available modules. And this is the performance that our prototype mini modules have had under the same testing scenario. We're also able to do a 10x of the rigorous humidity freeze. And from a mechanical perspective, some benefits that I won't go into here that allow the module to do 2x of the typical mechanical load uh, requirement. That is simply support, we can put two, two times the weight on that. So in addition to being robust from moisture ingress perspective and in UV, it's robust from a mechanical perspective. Last key aspect is materials cost modeling. So as part of DOE Sunshot Award, we looked at the costing of this process in some significant detail. Now this chart shows only the materials costs. And the numbers obtained here are for a, a fairly modest 200 megawatt a year production volume. But the numbers were obtained from a supply chain executive who's involved in thin film solar. So these are not me calling up on the phone and asking vendors for prices. These are sophisticated numbers, pardon me, numbers from a sophisticated manufacturer that were negotiated over the period of time by supply chain executives. 
Again, not cost, not rolled into this cost of the benefits associated with CapEx improvement, manufacturing efficiencies, factory footprint, or the opportunities associated with increased reliability. And given different scenarios, you can see approximately a two cent a watt benefit for a 100 watt module. That's fairly significant in this day and age when modules are selling, but our manufacturing costs for modules are on 40 cents a watt around the country. So what are the next steps? Well, the, the pardon me, what are some additional opportunities and next steps to realize that? that there's some other manufacturing uh, benefits that are somewhat buried within this technique that don't immediately come out, but they could be significant benefit to a module manufacturer. This technique enables large format modules. The vacuum lamination process is inherently not uniform. Putting this material into this large bladder, you see edge pinch around the perimeter of the module that isn't necessarily beneficial. It puts in a residual stress. And different areas within those large laminators have different performance for lamination. A module that, comes, uh, that goes packed in the corner of the laminator is a different one that's in the center. This process, since it's not a batch process, and since it's using these flowable polymers that have a ability to conform to the structure, enable this large format manufacturing. With reasonable tooling, we could have an agile process that could run different size modules on the same process. We could have a couple two foot by four foot modules come down. We could have a number of four by eight modules come down and then back to two foot by four foot. In a sense, it would tell the tooling which module is coming down the line, and it would immediately be able to accommodate that. Tool is easy to replicate. We're using standard industry XY tables and hardware that's been pulled from other industries and that's fairly standard. So this is an opportunity to expand. We're not going to be caught with waiting for them tool suppliers. And another aspect is because these materials are, can be put down and conformal to the substrate, we're able to accommodate greater tempered glass distortion. And that could mean less rejection of glass for uh, the supply chain. The ceiling technology, as I mentioned, is also suitable for the back box. Okay, so great. We've got potential opportunity here improve costs, improve manufacturability, and improve reliability. But what are the next steps? Uh, right now we're developing a partnership with Enra. Uh, this is an opportunity under Sunshot. I can't go into all the details because it hasn't been arranged, but we're looking forward to an even further collaboration with our colleagues at Enra, Francis, and other technologies. I mentioned we need to refine the polymer selection for the internal polymer there. We can't just specify a polymer in a vacuum. We need to work with vendors and use a polymer that's readily available and that can be manufactured in volume. So the next step is to work with the vendors and make sure that we specify the polymer that hits our technical requirements but is able to be fabricated and sourced in sufficient volume. Then we need to take this design and fabricate modules. So hardware needs to be fabricated to actually manufacture modules and then put them under very accelerated testing, including the, the thresher test, long UV, and long 85-85 damp heat. So in summary, the module architecture is a key aspect. It drives the reliability. It's a significant source of cost for the CAD tire thin film PV, and there's some manufacturing efficiencies associated with the current module laminated structure. DOE says if you can get a 50-year life, we can hit three cents a kilowatt hour ubiquitously across the U.S. and make solar the dominant electricity option from a cost perspective. But we've seen historic issues with some less sophisticated module manufacturing, but we've identified opportunities for improvement, particularly in UV and edge seals. And silicones are really the key for long duration UV performance if you look both from a theoretical perspective, from a chemistry perspective, and also you look to what's used in industry and critical applications. We've had prototype modules that have gone 8, 5, pardon me, uh, 4,500 hours at 8585. 
in contrast to modules just a few years ago who struggled with that, 10x the humidity freeze, and two times the mechanical load performance. From a manufacturing perspective, it's three to, time, three to five times faster in line with other processes. It's a significant reduction in factory footprint and CapEx costs, and perhaps most importantly, a one, up to a 1.8 cent per watt materials cost reduction. Uh, we also have the opportunity to, to easily fabricate large format modules and potentially reduce sensitivity to temper distortion. I would like to thank the DOE for their support, particularly for the costing activities here, and of course the team at the Next Generation PV Center. Thank you. Um, we've got uh, one question. Oh, it looks like two questions that came in during your talk. Uh, can you see the chat window, or would you like me to read them to you? Why don't you go ahead and read them, John? I'm, I'll go ahead and read them. Okay. No problem. So uh, Russ Porter asked, uh, if you were to take the potential reduction in costs, as you indicated, what would the potential kilowatt uh, hours costs be? Great question, Russ. Um, kilowatt hour versus manufacturing costs require very sophisticated calculation, as you know. So we're able to see almost a two cent watt peak from a materials cost. How that translates cost per kilowatt hour depends on where the models are deployed and such like that. However, we do know from the NREL study that if we can hit the reliability, hit the reliability even with uh, minimal changes to the manufacturing cost, we could see a ubiquitous three cents a kilowatt hour. Not able to answer the cost, some aspects of siting and, and deployment region where how much insulation there is, all those have to be rolled into the, the LCOE number. But we do know that ultimately there's the opportunity to cut the LCOE number potentially in half through the efficiency improvements and reliability improvements. Uh, great, thanks, Kurt. Uh, the, the second question was from uh, Brian Corgel, and he asked, is there any advantage uh, offered from Catelluride over SIGs or silicon that other future advantages um, would take uh, this module packaging and reliability would affect? Catel is the, is the lowest cost to uh, PV, and it seems to be fairly reliable. Um, they're, First Solar's done a great job in developing a, a reliable product. Um, and NREL studies have shown that amongst the thin film and even amongst some of the undifferentiated crystalline silicon that the cad tell can be more reliable than, that is, has less degradation rate than sigsamorphous silicon and even some of the polycrystalline uh, silicon. The, there, there may be a potential benefit for cad tell from a theoretical level that it's a super straight configuration. Uh, that we were able to more easily encapsulate that. We've looked at using some of this dual edge seal encapsulation technology for for substrate configuration and have a transparent uh, internal polymer and put the desiccant around the perimeter. Um, that that activity hasn't um, progressed too far. That's more in just a theoretical stage. Okay, great. Uh, are there any other questions from any of the attendees? Uh, if, if you'd like, feel free to use your microphone uh, or, or type them into the chat window. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Uh, well, it, it doesn't look like there are any other questions, Kurt. So, uh, 
just wanted to say thanks again for your talk and for taking the time to put it, uh, the, the, the presentation together. For those of you who uh, joined us for the first time, this is an ongoing series and we will continue to uh, have these talks going forward. So please join us again in the future. And thanks again, Kurt.